Today uh, and this week, I'd like to talk about writing, um, and specifically how writing can uh, create or solve uh, problems in ethics. Um, and I should say at the outset, as I did at the first day, most issues in writing I don't really think are, are principally properly thought of as ethics issues. They're about, um, you know, about quality of writing. In fact, maybe one place to start this conversation is to ask any of you, who's, who's a writer that, that you admire? Uh, anyone? Um, fiction, nonfiction, doesn't matter. Uh, just for point of sort of starting the conversation. Anyone want to offer a writer you like? Yeah. Um, Jane Austen. Jane Austen. Tell me why. <clears throat> Uh huh. So scene and language and uh huh. Anyone else? Yes. Oh uh huh. I don't know the uh, I don't know his work, but when, what do you like about him? What is it? Uh huh. So there's something about this the stylistic approach that you appreciate. Anyone else? Yes. Uh huh. And why there? Uh huh. She has a beautiful command of language, uh, also. Uh huh. The way she presents, right? Um, all right. Well, there's a couple good examples. We're talking about uh, sort of rhythm and language and, and the kind of musicality in the case of Angelou. Um, scene. Uh, all of those are, are certainly ingredients in great writing. I would cite a couple others. Uh, for me, uh, I mean, some favorite writers of mine would be Hemingway or James Salter or uh, um, Cormac McCarthy, Joan Didion. All writers who uh, appeal to to some of the same things that you're talking about: precision with language, clarity. Uh, uh, a simplicity sometimes, that, that surface simplicity that belies a real depth to the writing. Um, similarly, uh, I do a lot of nonfiction reading, um, principally in the book side of my life, uh, where there you find biographers and others who really have to command an enormous amount of uh, organizational detail and put stuff that is presented in a kind of logical way. Um, well, all of those uh, techniques are present in journalistic writing as well, uh, sometimes in smaller bites, obviously, than in a full biography or a novel. Um, but you know, there are narrative writing, there's different kinds of journalistic writing, uh, and each has their own kind of imperatives. Um, they're great uh, narrative writers. Uh, J.R. Moringer, my friend, um, Barry Siegel, Barry Birak. These are, these are great storytellers in journalism. And though they do a lot of work for newspapers and magazines, their work is what we would call narrative in style for the most part. It tells a story. Um, there's also investigative reporting, uh, which has really special implications uh, for ethics. Um, you know, these are inve the great investigative reporters, um, people like uh, Kevin Sack of the New York Times or David Willman, uh, who used to be of, of our paper, um, very methodical, uh, very exact, very precise. Um, you know, these are, these, this is the kind of reporting where you're often identifying someone who's done something wrong or, in effect, making an accusation against someone. All the more important that those details be precisely presented. Um, and finally, another one more category, although I could go on and on with this, uh, beat reporting uh, is a, uh, an important category of journalism. That's uh, what I've spent most of my life doing. Um, that's where you cover an institution or a person, a politician, a, an office, uh, a mayor, a senator, a, you know, the Congress, whatever. Um, you know, and the, great, the base, best beat reporters, uh, in addition to having to do some of the things that I've just described in other kinds of writing, uh, have to muster a certain kind of courage uh, because it takes a special kind, it's a special kind of accountability that requires you to go back over and over to the same people again and again to write critically about them uh, and then to face them. Uh, you know, uh, journalists, uh, for the most part, write under bylines. It's a highly accountable profession. People know what you've written. Uh, if you get something wrong, they're there to tell you about it, uh, and you are to be held accountable for it. So across those disciplines then, I guess I, what I would say, and the ones that you cited, uh, the authors you cited, I would say that there are some common points of good writing um, are that it tends to be clear, there's real clarity to it, uh, there's an intensity uh, to it, and there is an attention to detail. Um, and that is true whether we are talking about a work of poetry by Maya Angelou, uh, a novel by Jane Austen, or an investigative piece uh, by Kevin Sack. Um, and the way that that to, comes home to what we're talking about here uh, is that bad writing can really create ethical traps for you. Um, writing that is unclear, writing that is imprecise, um, uh, writing that is sloppy with details sometimes can, uh, can create an ethics problem uh, in a story, or sometimes it can, uh, if the story has another problem with it, it can, let you, it can sort of mask that problem so that you don't see clearly what the problem is. The contrast of that, attention to detail, clear writing, 
um, precision, those can often either help you spot an ethics problem in a story or actually write your way out of it by disclosing certain things to readers. So I know you've all read the Eisman case, uh, and I want to get to that uh, in a minute. But before we do, I want to talk about another case that you didn't read, and so I'll, I'll, I'll brief you on it. Um, and this involves uh, the Atlanta Constitution uh, and its coverage of the Olympic bombings uh, in 1996, uh, specifically uh, the alleged involvement of a guy named Richard Jewell. Um, to give you the background, uh, and again, this is not the kind of stuff you need to master for your exams, but um, on July 27th of 1996, uh, the, the Summer Olympics were being held uh, in Atlanta. Um, and I guess I should say, just by way of background, I actually had worked for the Constitution and know many of the people involved in this case, but I was not working there at the time of this, I'm happy to say. Um, uh, the festivities around the Olympics uh, included the creation of something called Centennial Park, uh, which was an area near the center of the events that was intended to be sort of for festivities and concerts and gatherings. Um, well, just before uh, 1 o'clock in the morning uh, on the 27th, uh, the police, the Atlanta police, got a call through 911. Uh, it was a male voice, and it said, there is a bomb in Centennial Park. You have 30 minutes. Um, uh, well, uh, before a few minutes go by, and but before any alert had ever gone out, uh, a security guard who was working in the park, named Richard Jewell, um, spotted a suspicious backpack. It was all by itself. It was a knapsack, as was always described, I guess, in the coverage. Um, and he started clearing people away. At 1.20, not, in fact, a full 30 minutes after the call, but at 1.20 a.m., the bomb went off. Uh, and, in fact, it was in the knapsack. It killed two people and it injured 111 people. It was a serious event, as some of you may remember. Um, the next day, Jewel uh, was hailed as a hero uh, in much of the coverage, because he had cleared a lot of people. Presumably, he had saved uh, a lot of lives, or at least a lot of injuries. Um, he went on TV. He went on the Today Show. Um, Katie Couric sort of gushed over him uh, on the Today Show. She said, you were in the right place at the right time, and you did the right thing, Richard. Uh, and that was quite typical of the coverage the next day. Um, well, you know, needless to say, this was a huge international story. The whole international uh, sports media and other media was gathered there in Atlanta. The bomb had gone off. People were dead. So there was a giant press, both by law enforcement and by uh, media, to try to figure out who had done this. Um, uh, the Atlanta Constitution's uh, lead uh, investigative and, and law enforcement reporters uh, obviously immediately rolled on this story. And on July 30th, the lead story of the Constitution, uh, under a banner headline, uh, uh, that read, FBI suspects, quote, hero, end quote, guard may have planted bomb. Uh, and then here's the top of that story. Uh, it read, uh, the security guard who first alerted police to the pipe bomb that exploded in Centennial Olympic Park is the focus of the federal investigation into the incident that resulted in two deaths and injured more than 100. Richard Jewell, 33, a former law enforcement officer, fits the profile of the lone bomber. This profile generally includes a frustrated white man who is a former police officer, member of the military, or police wannabe who seeks to become a hero. It goes on more, and I can dip into it again in a minute. It says it goes on to say that he had sought out attention um, for his role in the bomb, that he'd gone on Today Show, that he'd come to the Constitution, sort of you know offering himself up uh, for publicity. And then it goes on beyond that, too. Um, Okay, so now I realize you don't have that in front of you, so it, it's harder than if you had the text in front of you. But let me just reread the lead and then ask you a question about it. It says, the security guard who first alerted police to the pipe bomb that exploded in Centennial Olympic Park is the focus of the federal investigation into the incident that resulted in two deaths and injured more than 100. Okay, so here's my first question. Who does that information come from? I mean, we're getting the Constitution, but who did the Constitution get it from? You have no way of knowing, right? That's a trick question, sorry. Um, uh, uh, there's no way of knowing. There's no way of knowing because there's no source identified. Now, if you'll recall in our conversations last week about anonymous sources, the Constitution is obviously not telling you something. Um, it's not telling you where they got the information. It's not, not only is it not naming uh, the source of the information, it's not giving you any clue uh, where it came from. Um, I, I want to return to that in a minute, but keep that thought in mind. Um, Another point, let me read the second graph again uh, and ask you a question about it. Richard Jewell, 33, a former law enforcement officer, fits the profile of the lone bomber. This profile generally includes a frustrated white man who is a former police officer, member of the military, or police wannabe who seeks to become a hero. Um, okay. It says it, he, uh, the profile generally includes a frustrated da 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 da. Um, uh, I guess my first question, if I were reading this as an editor, would be to say, does it generally include or does it always include? Whose profile? 
Um, and how many people fit this profile? I mean, there's a lot of frustrated white men uh, who are former police officers in the world. Why is Richard Jewell so uniquely fit um, this profile? Um, and you know, then as I said, it goes on to say that he courted publicity as if there were something suspicious about that. I suspect the Constitution wanted to speak to him. So the idea that somehow now doing what the newspaper asks you to do, which is to talk about what happened, is now a, an object of suspicion ought to give newspaper reporters uh, a little pause. Um, and finally, I guess I would say, and I, I alluded to this a minute ago, fits the profile. Well, I'd like to know whose profile. I mean, is this the Atlanta Police Department's profile? Um, is it the FBI's profile? Is it a profile that are do some of the investigators think that he fits the profile perfectly and some not? Do they all agree? Uh, is he the only person who could possibly fit the profile, or is he one of 10,000 people who could fit the profile? Well, um, none of that is apparent in this story. Um, so this, the point I'm trying to make here then with respect to writing is you know you've got a worrisome story on your hands if you've got a lack of clarity, a lack of uh, sourcing, um, a, there's an imprecision about this that ought to cause thoughtful editors to wonder if there's something amiss. Um, now, as I mentioned, I wanted to return to the issue of sourcing on this, because the sourcing issue in this is uh, like none other that I have ever heard of. Um, the Constitution, uh, you'll recall when we talked last week that I said that some newspapers were so sort of uh, gun-shy about the idea of using anonymous sources that they had barred it or tried to limit it or tried to take it off their pages. The Constitution is one of those uh, newspapers, um, and the Constitution uh, decided, uh, to tell you the truth, I'm not quite sure when, but sometime before this incident in 96, obviously, that it would no longer use anonymous sources in its pages. Um, what, it did, what it did that is frightfully wrong, though, is that it didn't stop relying on anonymous sources. It just stopped admitting that it was relying on anonymous sources. It adopted something that reporters there referred to as the voice of God. Uh, so you would go out and talk to sources anonymously and not, not attribute the information to them, and then the paper would just eliminate the sourcing altogether. So in this lead that I read you, it doesn't end with according to, you know, that he's the focus of this investigation, according to federal and, you know, local law enforcement officials. Or it doesn't say, you know, uh, according to sources close to the investigation. You have no way of knowing because the Constitution wants you to think that it's not using anonymous sources even though it is. Well, that's kind of the worst of both worlds uh, in the use of anonymous sources because that's inheriting all the problems of using anonymous sources without even attempting to be honest about the fact that you're doing it. Um, so I, the voice of God, uh, which is uh, inept, uh, inapt, obviously, in this uh, story, but that idea that the paper is just going to sort of pronounce from a mountaintop about what the facts are deepens the problem here. Because now, now not only are you accusing someone of being you know, the focus of this investigation or a suspect in the investigation, um, but you're, doing, you're saying that the newspaper itself is making that assertion. So it, it, you would have problems, uh, I would argue, even if this were properly attributed. There would still be the issue of are you identifying him correctly? Is it fair to do this to him? There'd still be a whole host of issues on this. But when you take away even the pretense of trying to be candid with readers about where you got the information, you've just in, increased the burden on the newspaper uh, to be correct. Um, still, before I go on on this, though, let me pause over one aspect of this, which is that in one sense, this story is true. Uh, it is true that Richard Jewell, as of July 30th of 1996, was in fact a focus of the FBI's investigation. By the way, the word focus is another clue that you may have a problem on your hands because the FBI doesn't really have focuses or foci, I guess that would be. It has suspects and it has, you know, I mean, so that's, that's language that suggests a kind of squirreliness. So uh, on the, I put that in the category of imprecision. But, but whatever we call him, a suspect, the focus, whatever, it is true that on that day, the FBI was looking at him and asking whether he might, whether he should properly be thought of as a suspect. So the ethics question, or an ethics question, I guess, in this is, is there any problem with that? If the newspaper or any news organization properly reports that a person is a suspect, even if that person later turns out not to have done it, has the newspaper done anything wrong? Anyone have an answer to that? Yeah. I think it might depend on the language that they use in the mm -hmm. article. Because sometimes, like, how you say it can um, kind of blame someone for doing something 
Mm -hmm. I think that's a good distinction. I mean, what you want, you want to try, I think, to draw, I'm sorry, go ahead, yes. <clears throat> um, well, the first part of that question is if the newspaper properly reports that. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that the um, Atlanta Constitution kind of came out of a, a sort of an accusatory angle as opposed to just a suggestive one of being mm -hmm. sort of just focused on this guy as opposed to the multitude of other suspects that they were looking at. Well, and that's an excellent point uh, because we don't. Uh, there, the FBI was not saying at this point, in my understanding anyway, that he was the only suspect or the only focus. And that's, I suspect, the reason why we have, well, it says the focus of the federal investigation. But, and that implies that he is singularly uh, uh, under suspicion. Um, and that may be inaccurate. I, I don't know. But please. I think that if there are multiple suspects, that should be mentioned. Even if it's at the end of the article, there are other people being investigated. It goes a long way to say that you know, this is not Mm -hmm. You could certainly imagine a second or third paragraph of this story that said, you know, although Jewel, uh, you know, is uh, under scrutiny by the FBI, uh, you know, sources, of course, they wouldn't do that, but, you know, others say um, that there are additional people being looked at, that he's not the lone focused. I mean, I would think that language would have helped a lot. Um, and it would have made this, while, it, while this may not be technically inaccurate, um, it would have made it far more uh, thoughtful and comprehensive. Anyone else? I thought I saw a hand up back there. You're, yeah, please. I was going to say, it seems that there's a fine line between um, suggestive and accusatory. That's a good Depending on the perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and let me say, too, uh, and again, I try not to uh, bore you with uh, just my own experiences, but um, I wrote a story like this um, on the, uh, the day, uh, I should have uh, printed it out so I get my date straight, but um, I believe it was a Wednesday or a Thursday in the Simpson case after the murders had been committed, but before Simpson had been arrested. I wrote a story uh, that ran on the front page of the LA Times saying that Simpson was a suspect in the case and police expected to arrest him imminently or shortly, or I forget the, the word. Um, they did not arrest him the next day, and believe me, that was the most stressful day uh, of my life. Um, but they did, as you know, of course, arrest him, uh, I think it was the day after that. Uh, but I spent that whole day with the managing editor of our newspaper, you know, stopping by my desk every hour or so, saying, I really hope they're about to do this. Um, you know, there, though, I guess I will say in my defense, um, first of all, we were right, so that's helpful. Um, but uh, it, it was also not based on the notion that Simpson fit a profile, an undefined profile. It was based on the notion that he had physical injuries and opportunities and a history of violence with his uh, then ex-wife um, that caused police. So we were able to say why it is that the police suspected him. Um, nevertheless, predicting that someone will get arrested uh, or saying that someone is a suspect has certain uh, risks uh, inherent to it. Um, there is one uh, detail in this story, uh, though, that, that wouldn't be obvious to you from the short read I gave of it, but let me tell you that I do think where the Constitution really missed an opportunity to inject some skepticism in this uh, is in the notion of, uh, well, it, it relates to this idea of fitting the profile of the lone bomber. Um, as I mentioned to you at the very beginning, uh, there was a call made to 911 about 20 <coughs> minutes before this bomb went off. But Jewell was already clearing people out of the area just a few minutes after they got the call. And the question I would have asked, and I don't know whether they did or not, but that I would have urged them to ask in this case was, do we, can they match the voice on the tape on the, from the 911 call with Jewell? Do, can they show that Jewell did it? Um, the reason is that the profile that they're working off of is of a lone bomber. So if the caller is not Jewell, then he doesn't fit the profile. Uh, because then he's a bomber working with someone else, then presumably bombers who work in pairs are not necessarily frustrated white men who are former police officers. Blah, blah, you know. it, it's, we're now into a different profile. Uh, as it turns out, Jewel did not make and could not have made the 911 call because they were able to figure out what phone it came from and where he was, and it took, I think it was like four and a half minutes or five minutes or something to walk from one to the other, and they knew that he was already clearing people out of the area within that time frame. So that then, once that became a known fact, then the whole case against him started to crumble, and ultimately uh, the FBI publicly acknowledged uh, and apologized uh, to him for having labeled him a suspect. Um, uh, 
and that it later came out in a kind of reconstruct of all of this that that fact was known short the fact that he couldn't have made the call was known shortly after uh, the investigation into him began. Now whether that was before the story appeared or not, I don't know. But that's asking noting the the sloppiness in the writing should cause an editor or a reporter to ask a question that then might have saved them this entire embarrassment. And my suggestion there would have been that a, a further exploration into what that profile was and whether Jewell actually could have fit it might have saved the J Journal Constitution a lot of heartache. Um, to conclude uh, this little uh, case study, let me just mention that in addition, um, that was the news story that sort of kicked this whole thing off. Um, a few days later, Dave Kindred, who is a celebrated columnist uh, for the Constitution, wrote a column that appeared on August 1st. Um, as is often the case with Kindred, it was very vividly written. Um, and I'll just, I'll excerpt it for you to make a point. Um, it says, you know, he sat in the shadows with his back to the world. He wore a white t-shirt, white shorts, and black sneakers. Occasionally, he turned his thick body and looked through the staircase toward the firing line of cameras, every lens fixed on him. You get the idea. Um, it's this sort of vivid account of this guy sitting there. And then it says, you know, he. Uh, uh, hero or fool, he sat on the steps and leaned to his right to make room for agents passing on the staircase, blah, blah, blah. Once upon a terrible time, federal agents came to this town to deal with another suspect who lived with his mother. Like this one, that suspect was drawn to the blue lights and sirens of police work. Like this one, he became famous in the aftermath of murder. His name was Wayne Williams. This one is Richard Jewell. Uh, well, Wayne Williams was a, an infamous uh, serial killer in Atlanta in the late 70s and early 80s. So this column then, which appears a couple days later, Richard Jewell's not been charged with any crime. Um, now the Constitution, in, you know, within its pages, has gone from describing the FBI's investigation of him, however inartfully, to under the, under the guise of, or in the, you know, in the form of a columnist writing about it, has compared him to one of the most notorious people in modern Atlanta history. Now, you can understand why Jewell then reads this and goes ballistic. Uh, at that point, and then he sued everybody, uh, the news, other news organizations that followed the Constitution got sued, and anyway, the whole case ensued after that. Um, but, but that's what happens when you take a, a sort of sloppily attributed news story and then take it one step further and make it the basis for a column that in effect compares this guy to, to one of the worst people. All people in Atlanta would have known what an awful thing it is to be compared to Wayne Williams. Um, um, anyway, so that's the, the, the sort of sad story of the Atlanta Constitution and the Jewel case. Um, I will, though, just, just re return to one thing before we move on, which is to remind you that for all the problems that this story had and all the ways that, uh, that a thoughtful edit of it might have, might have s solved some of those problems, it is also still fundamentally true that Richard Jewell was a suspect on that day. And so that's, uh, you know, the, the ethics are not all on one side here. Uh, that a, an accurate report of an investigation presented more thoughtfully than this one, I think could be defensible ethically. What became difficult with this one is that some of the sloppiness in the writing and the reporting um, undermined the uh, paper's ability to defend what it had done. Um, okay, where are we here? Uh, all right, Vicki Eisman in the New York Times. Um, you all have read uh, her complaint and you saw the story attached to it. Um, uh, before we get into it, let me ask you all a question. What do you think this story is about? The New York Times story? <laughs> Who would like to take a shot at that? No one? All right, well, let me offer a couple possibilities. It could be a story about McCain's relationship with Vicki Eisman, or, or a lobbyist. Um, it could be about a story about John McCain's uh, weakness uh, for sort of getting himself into compromising situations, whether those are in the Keating Five case or in this, in this incident. Uh, it could be a story about his hypocrisy on campaign finance. There's a lot of stuff in here about you know, rules that, that he uh, supported and whether he uh, followed the own, his own rules. Um, but the key paragraph, I think, in this story is as follows. It's somewhere near the top. It says, but the concerns about Mr. McCain's relationship with Ms. Eisman underscored an enduring paradox of his post-Keating career. Even as he has vowed to hold himself to the highest ethical standards, his confidence in his own integrity has sometimes seemed to blind him to potentially embarrassing conflicts of interest. Okay, that's a mouthful. Uh, but in essence, what that paragraph tells you is that this is a story about his relationship, about his integrity, and about his conflicts of interest. It's like the old... I don't know if you all remember it, the old Saturday Night Live routine about how it's a dessert topping and a floor wax. Um, uh, that's, a, that's a warning sign. 
Um, this story is much more thoughtfully and expertly written and edited than the Journal Constitution story that we just talked about. Um, but that paragraph <laughs> is, is a warning that this story is a grab bag of material. Uh, it is not just about Vicki Eisman. It is not just about uh, John McCain and his views on either campaign finance or ethics in government. It's going to be a story that tries to sort of connect all that together. Um, all right, so let's talk about the basic facts behind this one. On, um, this story was published on February 21st of 2008. Um, at height of the presidential campaign, John McCain, obviously, the, uh, at that, by that point, the sort of prohibitive favorite uh, to win the Republican nomination. Um, it, uh, it, the, the top of the story and the bottom of the story deal with uh, this Vicki Eisman. Um, and it notes that aides to McCain at one point were so concerned about his relationship uh, with Eisman, or what they perceived to be his relationship with Eisman, um, that they tried to block her from seeing him anymore. The sentence here reads, convinced that the relationship had become romantic, some top advisors intervened, da 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 da, basically to keep her away. Um, both McCain uh, and um, uh, Eisman were reached by the paper, both denied it. Um, it. But then the story, after noting their denial, says, but to his advisors, even the appearance of a close bond with a lobbyist whose clients often had business before the Senate committee that Mr. McCain led, threatened the, uh, threatened the story of redemption and rectitude that defined his political identity. Again, you can feel that the language of this is, is more thoughtfully done than the Constitution, but they are quite quick to dismiss his denial. They're going to report this over the denials of both of the principals. Um, it notes, uh, as uh, stories often do, the ages uh, of these people. John McCain, at the time this appeared, was 71. She was 40. Um, <laughs> she's uh, attractive. Um, she looks a fair bit like uh, Cindy McCain, which adds a little tweak to it. Um, so I guess my uh, another sort of threshold question I would ask here is, do any of you think we'd be reading this story if Vicki Eisman were a man, or if she were ugly, um, you know? I mean, <laughs> well, it might be a different story. Um, right. but, uh, but part of the salaciousness of this story is that, the, that it's about a relationship between McCain and an attractive woman who is much younger than he is. Now, whether that relationship is personal, professional, romantic, whatever, the story is sort of offering you different options, but it's clearly suggesting that at least people close to him thought that um, that that there was some inappropriate relationship. I think it's the best kind of news because it's the information and entertainment combined because it is relevant in that it has to do with our political system and someone who's in the a political figure, and it also has that entertainment part where it's like the scandal that you read in like People magazine. So it's kind of like the best kind of story. <laughs> true. Yeah. The best kind of story if it's true. Yeah. Uh, right. Um, absolutely. No, I think um, if you have it, if you have a story that says that you can, if you can prove that John McCain is sleeping with a lobbyist and doing favors for her clients because of his romantic slash sexual relationship with her, that's a blockbuster. It's a great story. Whether the story does that or not is another issue. Um, you know, I should say though, there is a story here, even if it's a man. I mean, even if it's a, even if she's not an attractive uh, woman. I mean, because if he's, if he's got a friendly relationship with a lobbyist, if he's, they are golfing buddies, or they go on vacations together, they go hunting together, whatever, um, and he's doing, fa and he's, you know, using his position to help the clients of that person. That's just as good a conflict of interest story. It just doesn't have what you described as the sort of, it doesn't have that kind of sexy uh, overtone to it. It's not as much fun, uh, but it's, uh, it's got the same kind of meat to it if you could get that story. Um, okay, so then the third question I would ask about this story is, does this story allege that they had an affair? You say yes. Yes, what do you think? It's not written in there, but it's definitely implied. It's heavily implied. Uh -huh. And furthermore, it's a story based on a rumor. If you want to read about rumors, you could just read people. I don't know what the truth is. Is it a rumor, though? I mean, if. Um, well, this kind of rumor. Mm -hmm. Right. But what if, let's assume one fact of the story to be correct, which is let's assume that the people close to McCain um, who, who wanted to protect him from a scandal became so convinced that she was, uh, that they had an Im Im improper relationship, well, let's call it a romantic relationship, and they, that they got so concerned that they had to start blocking her from seeing him. Is that a story? Even if, even if they're wrong? 
See, that's uh, this is this is a little bit like the Jewel instance. I mean, if if the FB if the paper is right in reporting that the FBI believes that Jewel's a suspect, that's a, that may be a story even if Jewel <coughs> turns out not to be a suspect. Well, here it may be a story that they be, that his aides became so concerned about her uh, that they took action even if they were wrong, um, and that's where the <coughs> ethics of that get a little murky. And I think again. To return to what someone pointed out, I think uh, up there in the back, tell me your name again. Allegra. Allegra. Uh, what you, what her, your point earlier, I think, is, would be well applied to this instance, which is if you suspect that there was a relationship, but what you know is that, you know, what you're more confident in is that AIDS did something because they suspected there, were a, there was a relationship, then the obligation becomes not to be so accusatory in your tone, but to be more suggestive or to be more straight and factual, to build in any material that tends to undermine uh, that premise. Um, so, uh, you know, there are several points in this story, though, where there, it clearly leaves the impression that at least some people thought there was a romantic relationship. The sentence I just re read you, convinced that the relationship had become romantic. Um, uh, acknowledge, oh, there's, oh yeah, I should light upon this one a little bit. Um, there, are, there are two aides uh, who are interviewed further down in the story, they're presented further down in the story, um, that say they confronted McCain with their concerns about Eisman. And it says, both said Mr. McCain acknowledged behaving inappropriately and pledged to keep his distance from Ms. Eisman. Um, okay, this is again back to the sort of mushy language problem. What does that mean? Acknowledged behaving inappropriately. Well, let me suggest that there are an infinite number of ways to behave inappropriately. Um, does, is he saying there that his inappropriate behavior was that they had a sexual relationship? That they had a romantic relationship? If so, they should, say, they should tell you that. <laughs> I mean, uh, if not, then I guess my question is, what is this sentence trying to say? Um, he pledged to keep his distance from Ms. Eisman. Well, he might be doing that because he recognized that he'd gone too far in his romantic relationship with her and he needed to avoid a scandal. But he might be saying, I realize that you guys, that this is causing you some concerns, so I'm going to stop. You know, let's get her out of here because I don't want trouble. Even though I haven't done anything wrong, or maybe I behaved inappropriately and that I've been too flirtatious, or maybe I've been too public about seeing her at events, but, uh, <coughs> but, but I'm not saying that I slept with her. I mean, we don't know from this sentence what it is that McCain, what is the be inappropriate behavior that he's acknowledging. Um, and if the New York Times knew it, it should tell us what it knows. If it doesn't, then maybe they should just shut the fuck up. I mean, the, what is this? I mean, because this is, this is highly, I would argue anyway, that this is highly suggestive without being anywhere close to conclusive. And that's a problem, ethically. Um, let me add one other thing, and then I'm going to turn to the complaint and, and walk through some of the issues in the complaint. Um, when did all this happen? Any of you notice in this when this relationship is said to have occurred? Yes. 1999. This story is coming out in 2008, but all of the allegations in it date back almost 10 years. Um, so why are we hearing about this now is a question that, that I would ask. Um, obviously, he's a candidate for president now, so it's, he's, he's a relevant public figure. There's no question about it, and if he's a hypocrite or, or worse, then I think we're entitled to know about it. But I think it's also fair to ask, you know, he's, it's not like John McCain just entered the public limelight. He'd run for president before, longtime senator, extremely well-known person. Um, uh, it's strange, and I don't know exactly what lesson to derive from it, but if, if any of you were to find yourself working on a story or thinking about a story like this, that's something that also ought to send up a red flag, um, that this is, this is not something that's just happened and that you're just hearing about it. There may be some reason why it hasn't gone reported for almost 10 years. Um, so let's uh, work through the complaint. Have any of you ever read a, a libel complaint before? I doubt it, huh? Um, oh, you have? Um, how, in what context? I'm curious. Uh, law clerk. As a law clerk, right. Um, there, it's a special type of writing. Um, and uh, let me just point out a couple things in it. Uh, and again, we'll return to some of this later uh, in the course when we talk about the law here. But, uh, but I think it's interesting even without a complete kind of uh, legal uh, discussion of it. Um, on pay, if you have it with you, uh, if you'll open it to page 13, um, this, you know, starting with uh, 
page 12, it needs to, the, the complaint identifies what it describes as the defamatory meanings in the piece. Now, def, just to give you a slight bit of background, defamation means an, something that is untrue and that hurts a person's reputation. Actually, defamation, I think, can even comprehend a true fact that hurts a person's reputation. But in any event, in this case, what it's arguing is that certain facts or certain allegations in the story are both false and hurtful, that they have hurt uh, Vicki Eisman's reputation. Um, so, and, and I, the reason I want to pause on that for a minute is, is to say it's pretty obvious how this story hurts McCain because it casts him or at least suggests that he was kind of in dangerous ethical turf, that he might have uh, you know, been unethical or engaged in an improper relationship. He's married. Um, but, uh, but it's not quite as obvious, at least at first blush, why it's so damaging to Eisman. Uh, you know, even if the facts of this story are correct, it's not clear to me that she's really done anything wrong. Uh, I mean, you can argue about whether it's uh, wrong for her to sleep with someone who's married or to, you know, for, or for aides to believe that. Uh, but, you know, she's not the one who's got, uh, who's running for president. She's not the one who's accused here of, you know, of, uh, of sort of hypocrisy. Um, so the, the part of the complaint needs to make the case that she has been, uh, her reputation has been hurt by it. And that, it, that this, this part of the complaint is what goes through that. And at the bottom of page 13, it notes that, um, uh, it sort of gives you some of the lead up to it. And it says that uh, the concerns about Mr. McCain's relationship with uh, Ms. Eisman were linked explicitly to unethical behavior amounting to a conflict of interest. And as the complaint says, the phrasing was thus calculated to cast shame on Ms. Eisman because it suggests that she's sort of collaborating with McCain in a conflict of interest. So that's one, um, and that, uh, as the complaint notes, there is no conflict of interest when a lobbyist advances the interest of her clients in a lawful, professional, transparent matter, uh, manner. So therefore, the notion that there is a conflict at work in this case suggests that there's something unethical about her behavior, too. That's then reinforced. If you go a few more sentences down, um, it says, after more discussion of Mr. McCain, uh, Senator McCain's career, the article quoted William P. Cheshire for the proposition that, the Senator, uh, that Senator McCain, quote, can be imprudent a phrase, again, suggesting reckless behavior. So again, we're now, they're, now we're taking different sources on different issues and putting them all together in one story. And what the complaint is alleging is that by doing that, it's creating this overarching sense that she did something wrong. Um, it continues, um, uh, yeah, well, and then on page 15, it deals with the passage that, w that I just talked about a bit, which is this question of acknowledging behaving inappropriately. Um, uh, it's, it also draws attention to something that I didn't mention a minute ago, which is that the two sources who are quoted in that are identified in the piece as having become disillusioned with the senator. Um, the notes that they spoke independently of each other and that they provided details that were corroborated by others. Um, well, that in some ways that's helpful because it shows the fact that they were interviewed independently and they said, sounds like pretty much the same thing strengthens both of their arguments. It suggests that you would, if you had them in the same room at the same time and they both said, yeah, I agree with him, that's less meaningful than if you've talked to them separately. It's revealing and coming clean on the fact that these are people who become disillusioned with McCain. So it allows you to factor that in when you take how seriously, when you, when you decide how seriously to take their allegations. Um, and then it adds this fact that they provided details that were corroborated by others. Well, that's helpful, but to my mind, not very, uh, in the sense that I'd like to know what those details were. Um, I mean, if the details are that they, you know, lots of people felt uncomfortable that she was around McCain, you know, that's less telling than if they're describing a specific meeting and they can tell you where it occurred, what time it occurred, who was in the room. Remember I talked the other day about, you know, if you're going to use an anonymous source, which these people obviously are, it's helpful to get them to give you other details that you can use to check the veracity of what you have. Who was at the table? What was, you know, where did this happen, et cetera. Things that you can then check with other people to get a sense of whether they're lying to you. It sounds like they did that here, but by not telling you what those details were, they sort of give you half a loaf. Um, uh, what else? Uh, um, okay, on page 17, uh, point number 26, um, Here's where the complaint deals with the denials. Um, now, in, in one sense, the fact that there are denials from both Eisman and McCain um, does show real effort on behalf of the Times. Uh, they're not trying to just slam this in without giving these, these two a chance to respond. But there's also a reality here. And I guess um, this is where 
I, let me call this the ethics of denials, um, which is to say, what is it really, I mean, what do you expect these people to say um, when you confront them with this? Yeah, it's possible, I suppose, that McCain could say, all right, you caught me, I'm sorry, I apologize, you know, not likely. Um, so the way these are presented, especially the fact that it says that they're, they're denied and then the Times immediately goes on to say, but, da, 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 but his, to his advisors, even the appearance of a close bond with a lobbyist, blah, blah, blah. The denials are dealt with in what I would describe as a sort of perfunctory fashion. Um, and, and as a reader, therefore, I don't think they mean much to me as a reader. Um, I read that paragraph as, as something that they had to put in rather than as offering a, a full defense, you know, uh, than fully trying to appreciate the other side of this. Um, you know, and, and I'm, I'm quite sure that m neither McCain nor Eisman were helpful uh, in, in helping them write that fuller response. So they're, you know, they're not blameless in this either. But if Vicki Eisman had said to me as a reporter, I did not have a relationship with him. I deny it emphatically. Um, I did see him on the following occasions, but never without another person in the room. I would, yes, we flew on the jet. There's a description of a jet trip that they took together. It notes in there that they were accompanied by an aide. Um, if she said, you know, that was always the case. I was ne I've never been alone with him. I'd add that. Now, I, I'm sure that she didn't give that to them. I'm sure they would have included it. But, but the just saying they both deny it doesn't do much other than feel like that's something you had to do out of a sort of a sense of obligation. Um, it's not a full and complete denial. Um, so I don't think it does much, much to change the sort of ethics equation here uh, of this story. Now, finally, then, on page 18 is the, the sort of crux of their uh, lawsuit, which says, in sum, this is item 28 on page 18. In sum, taken as a whole, the article would be understood by the average reader as communicating the defamatory meaning, meaning that Ms. Eisman engaged in an unprofessional and unethical exploitation of a personal relationship with Senator McCain, and that Ms. Eisman had an improper romantic relationship with Senator McCain, a married man, from which she gained advantage for her professional clients. Who thinks that that's true? That that does that does the story do that in your view? Yes. Yeah. Anybody else? Anybody think no? Sorry, go ahead, yeah. Um, I don't really see what the problem is. I guess because I feel like stories there's always scandals involving important figures in the newspaper, and like that's kind of something they have to deal with. Like um, I know she was. This is libel. She's suing for libel, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't understand, I think with public figures, doesn't it have to be more like directly intending to harm them than it does with? Well, one issue that always comes up in libel and that, and we'll, we're going to talk more about how this ended up uh, in a bit, but um, uh, one issue that always arises in libel is, is the person who is the subject of the coverage actually a public figure? Um, there's no question but that John, John McCain is the consummate public figure. He's a public official. Um, all public officials would qualify on, on almost certainly as public, uh, as, uh, public figures. Um, the question is whether Vicki Eisman is a public figure. Um, I think the New York Times probably could have shown that someone who was involved in, in the workings of government and lobbying to, had made themselves into a public figure. But that's all what she argues in the complaint that she's not, uh, or her lawyers argue that she's not. Um, the question of whether someone is a public figure or not is a very important one for establishing the standard by which the newspaper or the news organization will be held accountable um, in terms of its damages. Um, it is much easier to libel a private person than it, I mean, for in legal terms, it's much easier to libel a private person. You don't have to show that the newspaper acted with recklessness or actual malice um, than it is a public person where, just as you say, they have to show those things. Um, as an ethics matter, though, I guess I would argue that there may not be as big a distinction as there is uh, in the legal realm. Because just because you can go around uh, saying more uh, defamatory things about public officials than you can about private figures doesn't mean that you ethically should. So if this, whether or not she's a public figure, I think the story has to stand on its merits. And if, it, if it's a good story that you could write about a public official, or a private figure, then you should also be able to write about a, about a public one and vice versa. Um, but that's a legal standard, I think, more than an ethics standard. Other thoughts on this, on whether it's a fair story or whether this is a fair uh, uh, description of it? Yes, please. I think it was 
interesting, just like the undertone of the article, I think, is what got me the most. Because uh -huh. they stated early on that there might be a romantic relationship. And so I think that automatically gets the reader thinking, well, that's the point of the story. And then the undertone of his like mishaps ethically throughout his career, which I think if you take any public figure, they're going to have little things throughout their career. I think you automatically attribute those misuse of his ethics like to his sexual relationship as opposed to just saying, yeah, he's made some mistakes as a human being, just because of the undertone of the story. So then I feel like although they're not direct evidence towards his ability to maybe have been in this relationship, like they kind of play, they're playing with your ability to read the story well. And so mm -hmm. it's almost like you're going to attribute that to what you originally thought the story was about. Mm -hmm. about and let me ask you, I think that's a, a wise set of observations. Uh, I guess here's my question is, how does undertone get in a story? I mean, I think you're right to say that there's something tonally about this story, and yet, wh what what makes that? I mean, where how do you find that tone? Yes, please. I think sometimes even just the lead can can set that up. Sets a tone, because right? That's that's basically the point of the whole story. Right? right, and the lead of this story it leads with the sort of anxiety in the campaign, right? Uh, early in, the, in Senator John McCain's first run for the White House eight years ago, waves of anxiety swept through his small circle of advisors. So right away, we're not talking about something small. The, the, it sets up the notion that this is something serious. Um, story, or a premise of this story is that John McCain is not really that ethical. Um, that he says he is, and he, you know, he sort of accuses other people of being unethical, but that in the end, he's sort of slippery and not so trustworthy and that that's true of him personally and professionally. Um, and I guess I would say there, first of all, this is one of, the, again, to sort of repeat myself from earlier, if you have that story, then come out and say that. Um, this sort of uh, uh, lofty language uh, that tries to sort of circle around that question is in some ways uh, distracting uh, from the underlying point of the piece. It also feels to me like there's maybe more than one story here. That maybe there's a story about the Keating Five, and maybe there's a story about <laughs> campaign finance, and maybe or maybe not there's a story about Vicki Eisman. But trying to use each of them to bolster the other ends up creating a really complicated piece of reading. Yes? For me, the time, uh, from when it was actually happening in the book, to when they were reporting, it was a big problem. Because I know like, a lot of details in nine years can be forgotten or mm -hmm. distorted and so when they were quoting these people and talking about these people and their relationships have changed at this point, that was a big issue for me. Like, I didn't think the time was appropriate for this. And I agree that the time element really it both complicates the reporting of the story for just the reasons you described, that details are likely to be forgotten. To, um, uh, but I would pose the question, um, is there a statute of limitations on misbehavior by a political figure, say? Um, I mean, if John McCain had murdered Vicki Eisman nine years ago and we just found out about it, presumably that's still a good story, right? I mean, you don't get over that. Um, so while I, I agree with you, the time element gives me the heebie-jeebies in reading it. I, it makes me kind of wonder what's going on here. I'm not sure that it, I, I don't think that you can say as a blanket matter that just because something happened a long time ago that therefore it's off limits. Um, you know, Bill Clinton will be reminded uh, of, of Monica Lewinsky for till his dying day. It'll be in the lead of his obit, and he was president of the fucking United States. You know, I mean, so this is, uh, you know, you don't some bad deeds just don't get over, particularly if you live a public life like John McCain or Bill Clinton. Yeah, I think something <coughs> intense and, and, and serious is like if he had murdered Vicky Eisman. I think, I mean, just finding out about it nine years, nine years later, I think that. Inevitably, in the reporting, would be something about how difficult this case is to figure out because it's nine years on and we don't mm -hmm. have. I mean, that's the thing is they would know right. that. And they could that would be a, an excellent remedy, I think. That would solve my kind of, you know, queasiness. Uh, without going as far as, as might otherwise suggest, which is to say that after a certain amount of time, we're just not going to report on it at all. Um, right, I think if there were a paragraph in here that says these, these allegations are only coming to light now, nine years later, because, I don't know what the because would be, but you know, because the aides who you know, once uh, held their tongues now feel like with the presidency so close at hand that they can no longer stay silent about it. And I'm making all that up, obviously. But there may well be some kind of reason like that. If so, Knowing what that reason is w might help us not feel so uncomfortable with how old the allegations are. Um, anyone else? Yeah. 
Um, the way I kind of take this story is that they definitely violate the <coughs> McCain scandal and everything together, they kind of make a narrative of his unethical life, which he said professionally and personally. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of see this where, as an example of where maybe narrative writing isn't appropriate, maybe they should have done it more in the investigative report. Kind of straight newsy way. Exactly, yeah, just to, um, because definitely the narrative does contribute to the accusations. Mm -hmm. I. I don't know, again, I, I don't know any of the details of how this story came together. It's extremely uh, talented people who worked on it, so it's not a matter of just sort of stupidity. Um, but I do, it does feel to me like the, the, the story is not consistent in its tone. Sometimes it feels like a news story and sometimes it feels like a narrative story. It tends to feel like a narrative story when we're talking about Vicki Eisman and it tends to feel more like an investigative or news story when we're talking about campaign finance or whatnot. Um, I suspect that part of the answer to that is that you had a lot of editors uh, and a lot of thought uh, and a lot of back and forth and that certain editors edited one way and certain ones back another way. And again, it's this sort of, you feel like it's sort of cats wrestling in a, in a sack, you know? I mean, it doesn't feel like it's all part of one piece. One thing, I don't know whether they talked about this, but one thing that might have been worth talking about in this story is whether to pull it apart and to do more than one story. And then I think, had they done that, I suspect that the Vicki Eisman stuff would have ended up on the floor. Because if you take, if you take the other ethics accusations out of the Eisman piece, you really, the Vicki Eisman story really doesn't say very much. It just says that this attractive blonde woman, much younger than, than the senator, was around him a lot and it made some aides uncomfortable. Both of them say nothing happened. Well, I mean, I don't know if that's much of a story. Um, one of the problems that they had in this, I suspect, again, um, just viewing it from afar, um, is that most of the other stuff had already been reported. So there wasn't really, if you do that, if you go through what would have been a kind of healthy exercise to see if the Eisman stuff would stand alone, I'm not sure that then what you're, then, then you might lose all of this. You might have two old stories and one that doesn't measure up. And you know, anyway, I don't know whether they did that or not, but it would have been interesting. Yes, sure. I think the one issue that pops up is in on the sourcing. When you're um, interviewing two disillusioned campaign people, they obviously have, um, they might have some sort of agenda Absolutely agree. I think it's good of them to have acknowledged in the paper that they were disillusioned with the senator because it does allow you as a reader to say, okay, well, I don't take this quite as seriously then as if the two people are his most firm loyalists. On the other hand, one way to read that sentence, the way I first read it, frankly, is that they're disillusioned by this conduct, that they loved him or liked him, um, supported him, became frustrated about this relationship and that that caused them to become disillusioned. Well, if that's the case, then, then it's even more damning. It doesn't, it doesn't sort of lighten the allegation. It actually deepens it. The sentence is, uh, in, it doesn't provide sufficient information to, to make a full judgment on that. And a, a, a fuller disclosure might have helped that. Uh, yes? I don't understand why you say that they should have taken out the Vicky Eisman part because I feel like that was basically the entire story. Like the other part they mentioned, but that to me was like insignificant compared to the allegations right. about him having. I guess what I'm suggesting is had they done that, had they tested what this story looked like without the Eisman stuff, then they, could, they would have done two things. They would have asked themselves, do we really have a story about Vicki Eisman here or do we have a story about John McCain's kind of long, you know, public wrestling with the ethics of government, whether it's feeding five or relationships with lobbyists or campaign finance, all of which are utterly legitimate public questions to ask about his record. Um, the two questions I think that then would have arisen are, are we saying anything new about any of those things? Um, and do we have enough, if we just write a story about his relationship with Vicki Eisman and take the rest out of it, do we have a story that stands up on its own? And I think probably had they done that, they would have, they would have come to the conclusion that they just didn't have it nailed down with respect to Eisman. If they want to say that there's a relationship between them, they better have someone not who's just worried that they might have a relationship, but that who knows something. And, and they hint, you think that maybe they've got that when they say that he acknowledged behaving inappropriately. But as I said earlier, I don't know what the inappropriate behavior is. If he told those aides, listen, I slept with her and I regret it and I'm gonna keep her away from me now because I don't want this to hurt, you know, the things I care about, the politics of this country. Well, then come out and tell us that that's what he said. If he just said, well, all right, I'll stay away from her, it doesn't, it doesn't nail the deal. And I think the only reason for saying, let's pull the Eisman stuff out and look at it separately is to ask whether it would have fallen apart at that point. Um, if it didn't, then you know, full speed ahead, you know. Uh, yes? Um, also, in my opinion, like a big problem that sticks out to me in articles like this and in the Jules article, too, mm -hmm. is that 
once and like writing in a sloppy manner is that once the article's out, I feel like the damage is already been done. Like even if the FBI does apologize, even if they do do a follow up article saying we like our sources weren't balanced or something like that, um, there's still going to be a big majority of the public that all they can think about is this. Mm -hmm. And so I can definitely see how this could hurt Eisen's career and how it could, even if she does get the defamation, um, like recover and everything like that, um, it still kind of doesn't matter because mm -hmm. no matter what, a big section of the public is going to be. Right. And on Thursday, I'm going to. I'll keep you in a little bit of suspense here, but I will uh, on Thursday we'll talk about how this did get resolved. Um, I will just know, call your attention to the fact that the final page of the complaint um, seeks $27 million in damage. Um, now, I wouldn't have guessed that Vicki Eisman's whole career was worth $27 million, much less that there was damage to the tune of $27 million, but uh, it's a reminder that people, we play with big sums uh, here. Um, you know, and uh, you're right. I mean, what's, what's a reputation worth? I mean, if she is... Uh, anguished, as she describes herself as being in this, if it's hurt her professionally, both of which I suspect are true. I mean, I have no reason to believe that this was anything but terribly, uh, you know, unpleasant uh, for her. And I'm sure it's had professional ramifications. I mean, we are all sitting here and, you know, 3,000 miles away talking about Vicki Eisman. Without this story, we're, we're not having a conversation about Vicki. This is the only thing, I mean, I, do I know whether she's a good lobbyist? I have no sense of her reputation outside of this piece. So I think it's quite clear that it has had an effect on the way the world views Vicki Eisman. Whether it's had a $27 million effect is a, sort of a different issue. But, but you're right. Uh, simply, you know, what the Atlanta Constitution and the FBI ultimately have you know, come clean and said Richard Jewell is not, was not a suspect and was not properly thought of as a suspect. Well, Richard Jewell died a couple of years ago. And, and again, uh, do we know anything about, would we know anything, would we be having a conversation about Richard Jewell if he were not identified as a suspect? Well, a few people would remember him as a hero. But, you know, I think the record is pretty clear now that he actually was a hero. Um, I mean, he may not have, uh, you know, rescued a burning airliner, you know, but he got some people out of the way. He may have saved a couple of lives. And the fact is we, there's taint associated with him now. And nothing that the FBI or that the Constitution did subsequently ever totally cleared him of that taint. And he has talked about, he'll be talked about in journalism classes till the end of time, not because he was a hero, uh, but because he was accused of being a bomber. Anyone else? Um, well, let me just add a few other details on the Eisman case that are outside of this, and as I said, we'll talk a little bit more about it on Thursday. Um, there is a real competitive issue um, that runs through this, and the effect of competition on journalistic ethics is a really uh, live one, particularly as the nature of journalism uh, changes and the, and the, the you know, increasing uh, use of Internet journalism. Uh, on page 31 of the complaint, um, it notes that uh, on item 54, it was widely known within Washington political and media circles that the New York Times was pursuing the story. Um, that happens a lot in long-term investigative reporting like this. It takes a long time to get certain facts, and you have to ask a lot of people to get them. Um, in the course of doing that, word gets out, and then there's this pressure to publish. Um, Matt Drudge, um, the famous blogger, um, reported in December of 2007 um, that, that the New York Times, that there was a, I think there was the McCain people were trying to, were in a furious battle with the New York Times. I forget the exact language. I think it's in the complaint. Um, the New Republic uh, was aware of the New York Times' uh, reporting and was doing its own reporting on the same subject. And people at the New York Times knew that. Uh, so now, uh, you know, there is a, there is a pressure to publish. Um, and uh, it's, you know, there's, the New York Times can't sort of bottle that up. They don't want to be scooped. They don't want to be accused of killing the story, uh, you know, in defense of McCain. So now there's all this external pressure that's being brought uh, into the reporting and editing of the story. That uh, sadly happens a lot uh, these days, um, it, uh, particularly on uh, national stories, but but even on local stories. You know, their their stuff will get into the kind of you know ether of your sources and people around a story. They'll know about it and they'll start to ask questions about it. I can give you a little example locally. There were um, rumors uh, a couple of years ago that Mayor Villaraigosa was, uh, was, had left his wife, um, that he was no longer living uh, at Getty House. Um, and some of this, it appeared, I'm forgetting the exact uh, way that this sort of trickled out. But the, the allegation specifically was that he had moved out. So I had the pleasant uh, opportunity to sit down with him and ask him whether that was true. Um, it was not true as of that date that he had moved out of Getty House. And indeed, I don't think he ever did move out of Getty House. Um, 
he wouldn't comment to me about whether he and his wife were having troubles. And at some level, I mean, I, you know, the question of whether, if, if, a, if a public figure and his spouse or his or her spouse are having troubles, I don't really feel that that's much of anyone's business but theirs. Um, if the mayor had moved out of the official residence of the city, you know, the mayor's residence, the city of LA, that feels to me like a story. That's a, a development about him that goes beyond just their relationship. So we read, I read a very short brief that ran in the paper just saying he denies uh, that he's moved out. It, it, in fact, I talked to other people who said he's still living there. Um, won't comment on whether there's troubles between him and his wife. And then a few weeks later, it came out that there were troubles with him and his wife. He'd been having an affair, and they ultimately, I think they're still divorcing, but they are, uh, they, they did separate. Um, you know, uh, but well, the reason I mention all that is that the reason I sat down with him to ask him those questions is that there was a buzz uh, out in the, the sort of government circles in LA that something was amiss or that he'd moved out. Um, that happens, you know, you feel uh, a competitive pressure to stay abreast of stories, and in some ways that's a healthy pressure. I mean, you don't want to be lethargic or not report out stories uh, just because you're the only newspaper in town. Or, um, so there is value uh, to competition and all of it, but it also can force publication of things that are iffy. And it does feel to me like the, um, the piece the New York Times published on Eisman was pushed further than it would have been otherwise because there was a sense out in the, in the universe that they were working on it and they, needed to, they had a pressure to publish. Uh, okay, so just in closing today, and as I said, we'll return to Eisman and uh, the New York Times on Thursday. Um, uh, precision, I think, is often the solution to uh, <coughs> ethical quandaries in reporting and writing. Um, that specifically saying who gave you a story or when or how the events occurred that you're reporting on uh, or why you're writing about it uh, will not always save you from a mistake. But asking yourself those questions and forcing yourself to write them down, to put them in the story, um, will help clarify where there are holes in your reporting, where there are problems. Um, so it's worth doing, even if all of that doesn't make it into the ultimate story that gets published, uh, putting yourself through those exercises, I think, helps to illuminate the problems. And more importantly, not doing it uh, really invites trouble. Um, you know, as I said with respect to Jewel, uh, I think the, the Jewel reporting was really undermined first and foremost by the, 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 the policy deceit of the Atlanta Constitution in handling anonymous sources. That this idea that they were going to pretend that they weren't using anonymous sources by just not mentioning them is so fundamentally dishonest and so uh, mind-bogglingly stupid um, that that really created uh, a, a, a problem for them that this story then drew to national attention. And by the way, I assume they no longer practice the voice of God, but I don't, I don't know that. Um, the Eisman uh, story is a far less uh, problematic story, I think, in some ways. Uh, it doesn't accuse a person of a crime. It's, the allegations of it are, uh, are much less um, sort of horrific uh, than, the, than the Constitution piece. And the, the, you can tell by reading it that it's done uh, by, by experts. Um, nevertheless, um, I do think that there's a kind of indecision uh, throughout the Eisen piece, and we've talked about this already. But um, what is this story trying to tell us? And I think that the story never quite <laughs> comes clean with that answer because the fact is that it's not really clear what it is. Um, and that a, a sharper, harder, conversation about that, about saying, you know, say what you mean. Say where you got your information. Um, admit in the piece what you don't know. Um, it, you know, give people not just the opportunity to sort of uh, obligatorily deny the accusation, but explain their side uh, to the extent that you can. Um, question your own premises, you know. I mean, what, what may look to a campaign aide like something improper um, may not, in fact, be improper. It may tell you more about the campaign aid than it does about either John McCain or Vicki Eisman. Um, and then once you've sort of gone through those exercises, be clear about what you're trying to say. Um, I mean, I think that that's, that's where, in some ways, the elegance of the New York Times language in the piece distracts you from the fact that the substance of it is not as solid uh, as it appears. <laughs>